All right, folks, uh, thank you for your patience. Uh, my name is Don Pick, and I'm with the uh, Library Telescope team, and we've been doing monthly broadcasts uh, about the Library Telescope uh, program, and we've been trying as a team to uh, expand the program throughout the U.S. and also into Europe and other places, and we're excited to be in front of you tonight. Uh, we have a fun program um, about uh, uh, fun with a telescope, but uh, we have a program just to mark your calendar for our next month. It's uh, This program is going to be kind of fun. It's a library telescope programs for children. That'll be next month on February 17th. One of our newest team, team members, so Gerald Ramirez from the Kansas Astronomical Observers, has been having some fun doing some programs, actually not only in the evening, but in the daytime. And she's going to talk a little bit about uh, what she's been doing. And that's again, once again, next month. Uh, by the way, for the for the, tonight's program and all the prior programs, if you ever want to go out and see what we've been doing, you can go out to our website, librarytelescope.org, and we'll have a YouTube channel button up the very top right. If you click on that, you'll see not only videos from past programs, but also uh, some other helpful videos about how to use the Library Telescope. So focusing on tonight, uh, we've got two speakers, Chuck Sims from the Astronomical Society of Eastern Missouri and Rocky Togni from Central Arkansas uh, Astronomical Society. I think they're gonna have, you're having some fun with this and I'm gonna let these guys uh, just kick it over. Uh, what I will say is that if you are interested in following up on some of the links, we have a librarytelescope.org slash fun, F-U-N. If you click on that, you'll be able to see some of the links about things they're referring to tonight. So with that, I'm going to turn off my screen share, and Chuck, I'll turn it over to you. All right. Thank you very much, Don. As Don said, I'm with the Astronomical Society of Eastern Missouri. I've been working with the Library Telescope Program now for about six years, based here in St. Charles County, Missouri. Um, just really love this particular program, so I hope you have fun with this um, program that we're doing tonight. So I want to talk about the camera on your mobile phone. So the camera on the mobile phone has given everyone the ability to be a photographer. And I'm going to give you some tips on how to use the same camera for astrophotography. So this can be done by using a camera by itself or in combination with both hardware and software. And also uh, some other helpful videos. About so using the phone by itself works best for bright objects like the moon, but it's a little harder for working with stars, planets, and deep sky objects because they're so faint. So fainter objects need a longer exposure time. This requires changing settings in your camera. Uh, in particular, you'd have to look for the shutter speed option in your camera to do this. Bright objects like the moon also need some tweaking too, especially when it's over half full to full. It would need the ISO reduced. So the ISO reduce, reduces, uh, ISO controls the brightness. The moon is so bright and the background is so dark that it comes out overexposed. Now some cameras, some of the newer model phones have a built-in night mode. And what this does is it does the settings for you. So you would go to the night mode and just say, hey, I wanna take a picture of the moon or I wanna do you know, a picture of the planets and it would change the settings for you. Now, phones like the iPhone 12 would do this and some of the other new ones. Uh, most of us aren't uh, privy to those newer ones. So let's talk about what we can do. So when you're taking a picture or a video of the night sky, a tripod helps keep the camera steady and focused. So when you're taking a long exposure picture, you need that steadiness or else it's just going to be all over the place and you won't be able to uh, really get the long exposure you want, you just get a blur. So any tripod will work, even small tabletop ones, um, but you will need an adapter to hold the phone. Now these adapters often come in a lens kit, and I'll talk about those here in just a couple of minutes, uh, but they are crucial if you're using a tripod. Now, if you don't have a newer camera with night mode, what you can do is use third-party software. So the camera settings can really be confusing. I know I've gotten confused with mine a number of times. So downloading an app for just a couple of dollars or maybe even a free will save you time and an awful lot of headaches. Uh, there are settings in these for stars, star trails, satellites, meteors, and more. Uh, the one I use is called Nightcap Camera. 
I'm not endorsing that, but I am saying that I use it. It works well. And it was only $3 and it was well worth the money for me. Um, and like I said, it, it's got the different options. The meteor one is a really cool one. So on days when there's meteor showers, or if you just got a lot of time on your hands, you put it in the meteor mode, you point it in a, in a particular direction on like a tripod and you just leave it alone. And it will take pictures every couple of seconds. And it goes through a processing where it looks at each of those pictures to see if it's got something that thinks is a shooting star going through, a meteor going through, and it deletes the other ones. And so it leaves you with some pretty cool pictures. The same with the star trails and the stars. It just got some really great options to use. Now, I also mentioned with the uh, tripod, if you want to take video, and this is where this comes into play. So instead of taking one long picture, one long exposure picture, you take a video instead. So taking five minute, 10 minute, 20 minute video of an object, be it the moon or a planet, or even like, you know, a nebula, um, then you would use programs like PIT, PIT and AutoStack. And what they do is they convert each frame of the video into an individual picture. It goes through and figures out which pictures are the best. And it, it'll take the top 25 or top 10%, whichever you tell it. And it will stack those, literally put one picture on top of the other to do the same thing as a long exposure. So this does a really good job. So as an example, down in the lower left is a picture of Jupiter that's just a single frame on a video. And as you can see, it's very blurry. You can just barely tell that it's, it's an object that's around. But on the right, is after you take a video and you stack a couple hundred or a couple thousand of the best pictures, you get something that's very Jupiter-like. You can see the bands. So it looks really well. So I highly recommend video stacking. Uh, the downloads of PIP and AutoStack and there's other ones out there, they're free. So it, it works really well. And there's lots of videos out on YouTube uh, explaining how to use those too. Now I talked about a lens kit earlier. So this is just an example, one on the right. But you can see it comes with a small tripod that holds the camera. Those, um, the adapters will come off the small tripod and can be put on larger ones. It's got a number of lenses you can use. And these lenses work great for daytime videos too, or uh, pictures. It also comes with a um, Bluetooth remote, which I use a lot when I'm taking videos or I wanna take pictures and I get everything set up, but I don't wanna to touch the camera because I don't wanna move it accidentally by pushing too hard. So the Bluetooth remote takes that picture or takes that video for me, does a great job. These usually run 20, 30 bucks. I've seen them on sale as low as like 10 or 12. So just kind of look around, there's a lot of good ones out there and the cost will be the number of lenses and options you've got. So just getting a couple of lenses and the, uh, tripod and the adapter is, is well worth the money. And then finally, I want to talk about mounting the phone on, its actual, on an actual telescope. So you can take pictures of the moon and the planets just by holding the phone up to an eyepiece, but it's very difficult because you've got to have a steady hand to hold it there. So these adapters hold it in place so that you can actually just take the, the pictures easily. There's a number of adapters out there. They come in different sizes and price ranges. If you've got a 3D printer, you can download templates and just print it on your printer. They look like they work well. I haven't tried that yet. But I do want to talk about a couple of these mounts. So this one is just a quick adapter. Uh, they run about 15 bucks, so they're at the lower end of what they cost. Very easy to use. Literally, you would just take your phone, you would mount it on here, as you can see in the picture here. You would line the camera up so it's in the hole. So if you can see what's behind it through your camera, then you know you've got it lined up, you tighten it up. And then you put it on the eyepiece and you just literally twist this, the top counter or clockwise to tighten it and you're good. So at that point, now you're just aiming your telescope at the object you wanna get. You may have to use your focuser in order to focus it correctly. The camera will try to do some focusing for you, but you've got to get it close on the telescope. And then it's just taking pictures of the video. Does a great job. I did put that it can shift on the eyepiece. So if you're taking long videos or if you're touching it a lot of times with your finger to taking pictures, 
it can shift just because you know it's got uh, it's got a good grip but it doesn't have you know the best grip that you can get on here so for most times this is what i use does a great job but if you're taking longer videos or you need to move phones around a lot you want something a bit more and that is what this one is this is the next yz a little more expensive roughly around 60 dollars i put it's harder to learn but it's not that much harder it looks more complicated but it's really a great apparatus a um, couple of things you would lock this one on your eyepiece first it has a locking mechanism here, you can see. So once it's on its grip tight, it's not going to move. And then you can easily switch phones on this. So you would just pull this out, this lever to the uh, left here, pull it out. You can switch phones out in two seconds or less. And it's got three knobs, one for up, down, one for left, right, one for forward, back. So you got all three of your axis, X, Y, and Z. And so you can put a phone in there and have it lined up through the eyepiece in probably 10, 15 seconds tops, and you're ready to take pictures or videos. So this is, you know, if you're working at star parties like, you know, Rocky Dawn and I do, and there's person after person wanting to take pictures through your telescope, this works well. If you're just on your own and you just need, you know, something for yourself, I would go with the lower end. Works just as well for a single camera. So with that, I will turn it over to Rocky. Thank you, Chuck. And uh, for those of you that have been watching, if uh, we do have, we will have time for questions at the end. And Rocky, go ahead and take over here uh, as far as sharing your screen. Um, we do have questions that we'll take at the end and we'll have about 10 minutes or so we hope to be able to take questions. So uh, type them in the chat if you're on Zoom or in the comments area if you happen to be on Facebook. Okay, can you hear me now? <laughs> okay, um, I'm going to talk about uh, getting ready for your first time out with a library telescope. If you just go out, you could be it could be kind of frustrating trying to learn how to use your telescope, and try to find something. So half the fun of uh, of of astronomy is getting ready to go out. Uh, sometimes you, you have to wait days because of cloudy conditions or because the moon's up or something like that. So that some of that time you can spend getting ready and, and uh, it's no when you first go out, the more you uh, learn about it, the, uh, the more fun you'll have. So that, that's what I'm going to talk about. First, first is, is to look at what your library's got. Your library may have a lot of uh, astronomy books. I found my library had a lot more astronomy books in the kids section than it did in the uh, adult section. And it had a lot of good books. It had star guides and, and uh, books on individual subjects. Uh, so you can check out a book while you're waiting and, and start uh, learning about astronomy. But I've got another list of things here for you, for you to uh, think about. Uh, here's some books that you might uh, find used. Uh, and I've got a list of them on, on the handout that Don talked about. But uh, these three books uh, I got for less than $10 on uh, uh, used. Uh, so you can find some really good used books, uh, either a star atlas or something like a, the Turing the Universe with through binoculars is, is a really good way to start. When you get your scope, the first thing you need to do is practice with it. Uh, you, it's a lot easier to learn about it in the daytime. Uh, put the zoom eyepiece, it's, it's got a zoom eyepiece that goes from eight millimeters to 24 millimeters. And uh, so low power is the 24 millimeters. So you want it on the lowest power. So you'll have the widest image. Then find a distant telephone pole tree or whatever you can find. Just don't ever look toward the sun. Uh, learn to focus it focus on that object and then zoom in on it, go all the way up to eight millimeters. Turn on your red dot finder and adjust it if needed. Uh, so it is pointing at the same object that you're viewing. 
uh, and the hand, there should, you should have gotten a handout or a little booklet with your telescope that, that tells you about the red dot finder and turn it off when you get done. Uh, get comfortable with your scope because it's hard to learn in the dark. And uh, also you get a red light with your scope because uh, if you use a white light, it, it will ruin your night vision. Uh, your night vision develops as you're outside and, and it get, uh, for, and the longer you're out there, the better it gets. Using a red light doesn't hurt it, but if you turn a white light on, you can, uh, you can ruin it and you won't be able to see as, as dim as stars. Also, while you're waiting on your scope, you can figure out what you want to look at. Um, what planets, you know, some questions you might, would have are what planets are up, when is the moon up, what phase is it in, what season is it, so uh, I'll know what constellations to look for. And then after that, after you figure all that out, you can figure out which deep sky, which objects you want to look at your telescope with. Uh, and where you need to observe from. You don't want to, you know, if you've got bright lights in your front yard, you might move to your back lot, yard where, where you can block the lights. So that's, a, that's something else to think about. Um, a real good resource online is uh, skymaps.com. And they, they have a new sky map every month that tells you where the planets are and, and which stars are up and uh, any conjunctions and, and special events. So that's a good source. Um, on your telescope, if you're going to look at the moon, you might want to look at the map on your telescope and uh, uh, identify some of the, the, the first thing you'll probably see when you look through your telescope is the, is the dark areas, the, the seas or mares. And uh, so uh, uh, try to memorize a few of those sea names and uh, so you can identify them when you look at the moon and also some of the big craters that are listed on this. These are just really prominent craters that are kind of guideposts for you once you learn a little bit more about the moon. Also, you will, you'll probably get a book or a booklet with your, uh, with your telescope and you can, you can start uh, and you can look through it. And here's a couple that are provided with telescopes. We provide the one on the left in Arkansas. We provided the other one too and a lot of places uh, around the country use those same books. Uh, here's a, here's a, the way that uh, I try to teach, uh, I've tried to teach Boy Scouts to, to learn the stars is to learn them in, in groups. Like in the winter time, you, you want to learn the winter hexagon. And, uh, and some people call it the winter circle. And so get out your chart and start and write down the first magnitude stars and, uh, and, the, and the constellations. So you'll have an, and start looking at their patterns. Of course, Orion is the pattern that, that you'll first see. And that's what you start with to find the rest of the constellations. You take the <coughs> belt, three belt stars and go to the right to find Aldebaran, to the left to find Sirius. So you can do all that before you go out. And uh, once you go out, uh, then you, you can uh, find objects with your telescope. It's, uh, it's just as much fun to trace out the constellations though. Um, uh, I like to dwell on a lot on the first magnitude stars because they're kind of your signposts. And even before dark, before it gets totally dark, you can start picking out these stars and uh, uh, seeing some of these configurations. Um, <clears throat> but uh, this is a list of uh, the top 25 stars. And you can see that in, in the wintertime is a great time to start looking at stars. Uh, it's, first of all, it's dark longer, but there's a lot more bright stars out. You can see that 10 of the brightest 25 stars are in, this, in, in the winter hexagon. So it's really a spectacular part of the sky to look at. Each star has its own uh, story, dist uh, it's how far it is, color, uh, meaning of the star, and it's always part of a constellation. So there's a lot to, to learning those star names also. Um, then the constellations of the winter hexagon, of course, are Orion, Taurus the bull. Uh, I said Capella, it's Auriga. Capella is the, the star. Gemini the twins, Canis minor, and Canis major that has Sirius in it. And some objects that you'd want to look at with your library telescope 
and they won't appear as much in color, although the, uh, uh, the, they will be, you will be able to tell if they're red or, or blue or, or yellow. Uh, but uh, these, the Orion nebulas in the top left hand corner and um, Pleiades in the lower left. And then that's the constellation Orion, and I put that in there to show you the, the difference in the star colors. <clears throat> Betelgeuse is red, but you can see all the, all the rest of the stars in our Orion are, are pretty much blue. Another activity is to, uh, you can either buy a planisphere or you can make your own planisphere. And I've got a link in the resources where you would print out a, a couple of pieces of paper and, and cut cut and tape, tape your planisphere together. I taped this one together. Um, but it's really good for telling you where the uh, North, North Star is, uh, what's up in the sky, but also to look at and tell uh, where the Big Dipper is so you can find the North Star. And uh, the, learning the uh, Big Dipper and the North Star is just like having a clock. And that clock goes around once every 20, it's a 24 hour clock, it goes around once every 24 hours. And uh, in the winter time, about nine o'clock, it's at, it's at the uh, three o'clock position. In the springtime, at noon. In the summertime, it's at uh, nine o'clock, and it, at uh, in the fall, it's at the six o'clock position. So you can see how it goes. And and if you go out and look at it, and you go and you wake up in the morning and go out and look at it again, you'll see that it moves. Uh, you know, if you if it's six hours difference you'll see it moved a quarter of the way around the sky. So that's, that's a, a nice activity right there. Um, the rest of it, the book that I showed you, uh, Learning the Constellations, uh, has a asterism for each season. Like in the uh, uh, winter, you'd learn the winter circle or winter hexagon. In the spring, you'd learn the uh, spring diamond and the constellations and bright stars associated with it. In the uh, summer, you'd learn the summer triangle. And uh, in the uh, fall, the fall square, <clears throat> which uh, has all the characters in the Clash of the Titans, if you ever saw the, uh, the movie, they've, they've had a few movies on that. Andromeda, Perseus, Pegasus, Cassiopeia, Cepheus, and Cetus, they're all in the uh, fall sky. And also the, uh, our closest, our neighbor galaxy, M31 is there which is great through your, even better through your small telescope, a library telescope, than it would be through a big telescope. It's also good in binoculars. Uh, another thing is to, um, and this observing list is also in the, uh, in the, the handout that, that Don referenced. Um, and uh, it just gives you uh, the, the main objects to try to try for with your library telescope. All, all year long, you'd want to look at planets if they're up. All year long, you'd want to look at the North Star and the Big Dipper, Cassiopeia. In the wintertime, it, it, it tells you, a it gives you a list of objects there. You can treat it like a scavenger hunt and see if you can get all the objects. In the springtime, summer, and fall, it, it lists those objects. So that'll help you with your preparations to get ready with your library telescope. And uh, that's all I've got. Okay, well, great, Rocky. Well, thank you much. Uh, let's see if we have some questions. If you have any questions, please type them in the comments area. If you're in the uh, Facebook or if you're in the chat area, just go to Zoom. And let me see if I can remove the spotlight here. Hang on a second. Um, so, um, Chuck, let's go back to the camera for just a moment. I know that I have had so much fun with the folks that are... Um, coming up to our telescopes, they just love to take pictures of the moon. And what I found is that, you know, I like to hold it right up to the eyepiece because it's kind of fun to do that. But what I found is that when I'm trying to hold it up the eyepiece, align it to that hole and then pinch it to get it bigger, because if you pinch it, you can really get a very, very large uh, image on that. Is that your experience? That, that is my experience. Um, you know, and the moon is really cool because it's, it's so big when you look at it through the um, eyepiece. And I've seen some people take some great pictures of its setting, and it's got like a tree line in front of it. And the pictures just come out stunning. 
And those are just, you know, people that are there taking it. They've never done it before. Uh, but it all comes down to the steady hand. Um, but yeah, using the, using the pinches and making it bigger, that works well for uh, like Jupiter because it's still kind of bright uh, when it's up high. Um, so some great pictures of that, but a little bit harder when it comes to, you know, Saturn and some of the other ones. So I've been checking some of our Facebook posts here. We've got uh, folks from actually all over the world. We got from the Philippines and from South Asia. So if you folks don't have a library telescope program, you know, certainly reach out to us. Uh, we've been talking with folks in Europe and other places and we'd love to get you started. You may not have a program that looks exactly like ours, but certainly there's a lot of options. And I will say they're very, very popular. So Rocky, you've been doing this a while for scouts. I think scouts would pick up on this pretty quickly, right? I mean, you start looking at the stars and you know, when I went out the very first time, I remember when I was a child, and I looked out and I'd look up and she was, I just said, I don't know what's where, I have no idea. And what I didn't really realize is the sky changes every night a little bit. And you know, after a while you start realizing that because it changes, you not have to figure out where things are. And once you figure out maybe one big object, you can relate that object to others, right? And I've since learned that you can do what's called star hopping. Do you want to explain what star hopping is? Sure, that's when you uh, uh, have a configuration, you want to find a certain object or, or in the sky like the Orion Nebula, and you might start with the belt of Orion and then uh, uh, then you go down to the sword and you'd look at the middle star in the sword. And, uh, or you can find a M41 in uh, Sirius by starting with Sir in uh, Canis Major, by starting with Sirius, and just kind of looking at the chart and seeing where it is in relation to Sirius and another star, and so you'd star hop from uh, off Sirius in that case. So, do you guys? Uh, I just had a question here. Do we have? Uh, do you guys use laser points pointers to point out to other people where things are? How does that work? Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> you can't live without a laser pointer if you're That's at a right. star party trying to present. I think Rocky can attest to that. Oh, what, yeah. And, what and about all, the kids, all the kids want to hold it. Yeah. <laughs> what about on your telescope, though? Have you used that to point to where your, your telescope's pointing so people can kind of see, like, this is where the telescope's actually pointing? Yep. I, I do do that. So, you know, I, you know, I would say, hey, I'm pointing to Jupiter, or I'm pointing to the Orion Nebula. Then you use the laser pointer to point out in the sky exactly where it's at because you know from the untrained eye it's very hard to, to pick that stuff out but yeah as soon as you turn on the laser pointer then you got people going i want one of those that's the coolest thing i've ever seen <laughs> and you have that's to get them all that and back to the sky but it is it is fun so i've learned this over the last year i think because i'm fairly new at amateur astronomy uh, but you were talking chuck about taking videos of the uh the planets or the moon or whatever else at the camera well, there's a product called pipp which you've talked about chuck and what it is is a free program that once you get that video you can load that video into pipp and it'll it'll actually make sure that it's all centered up and really pretty and there's a thing called stacking that you can take that video make a little images out of each one and it'll make a pretty clear picture of a single image picture of what you've done, which is very, very cool when you really look at it. I was amazed how powerful that really that little product is. Yeah, no, and I, I agree with you because I've used both of them. So yeah, Dip doesn't actually do the the, the stacking. It does exactly what you said. It will uh, if you're if it's if the object is drifting in your eyepiece, it will center it all and make it all a good uh, streaming. And then when you stick it into your stacking program, an auto stack is the one I, I put on there, but there's other ones out there. Um, then it will you know, go through and it will stack them really easy, just pile them right on top of each other. It also gives you the options, if you just go through and look at them frame by frame and it'll let you do that, you can just say, hey, I want that picture just by itself. So if you're doing something like the moon or uh, you know, something that's really bright, uh, it does a great job just by you know, framing up a single form without stacking. So Rocky, I want to ask you a question. Um, we're not getting many questions with Facebooks here, so we're just going to ask ourselves questions, I guess. But it's just part of what I've learned over the time. You talked about the uh, Rocky. There's an eight millimeter to twenty-four millimeter setting on the zoom lens, right? And right. I, what I found is that people get confused. They always want to start with eight instead of twenty-four. Would you explain that once again why it's better to start with twenty-four millimeter? Well, with twenty-four millimeter, you get a wide field, and if you're looking for, I always uh, start with uh, my widest field eyepiece, which would be 24 millimeters in this case, and try and put it on a bright, 
put my telescope on a bright star and then adjust my adjust my finder scope or in this this instance a red dot finder so that it's pointed pointing to that star while it's in the telescope and if you have a uh, high power eyepiece in there it's very hard to find that star sometimes right so i got a couple more comments here uh one is that there is a sky and telescope it's a magazine they have the website sky and telescope and they have what's called a weekly sky to glance that's a pretty good uh product that we didn't talk about we've talked about in actually past programs but it might be something you look up Sky and Telescope magazine is called Weekly Sky at a Glance. And the other one is that how hard is it to, is for the, us to use the viewfinder to find something? What if it's out of alignment? As, in other words, this has come from experience. You look through that little red dot thingy and you're trying to, to find something in the sky and you find out it's a little bit out of alignment. Does that happen sometimes? In other words, it's not pointing to the same place the telescope was pointing, right? Right. That's why I always check it out when I first go out. Yeah. So and if your, it's off, if it's off, you won't be able to find that much, very much yeah. easy. Yeah. So to your point, what I like to do is in the daytime is to go find a sign and put the telescope to where you see that sign right in the middle of the telescope. You're looking right in the eyepiece and that's perfect. Then go make sure that red dot's, dot is lined up to be exactly on that sign. So when you go out at night, when you put the red dot on something like the moon, it'll be right in the eyepiece. Does that make sense? Yeah. And Don, just to kind of plug our uh, YouTube site, if people are interested in learning how to use the Red Dot Finder, we do have videos out there for both the Finder and our eyepiece, and then more general ones just on using the telescope. So you can get a lot of a lot of good information from the YouTube site. All right, guys, well, we're hitting on the half hour here. So if the folks that are out there, uh, particularly in Facebook, if you have suggestions on future programs, we've got several programs we want to still do here. And the next month, once again, we're going to talk about library uh, telescope programs for children. It'll be on February 17th. It'll be a fun little program. But if you have other topics, we'd love to hear what you have in mind or what kind of questions you have about the library telescope program. If you have questions, your library is not doing something or you want to start a program, go to librarytelescope.org, our Facebook page, which is Facebook slash library telescope. And just let us know what you're thinking. We've got a team watching this. And we very much thank you for joining us. And Rocky and Chuck, great job tonight. Thanks a lot so much for uh, sharing your expertise. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Yeah, have a, have a good evening, everyone. Thank you.